Q&A with Senator Chuck Grassley. Quad Cities Chamber is working right alongside businesses in our region during this difficult time, and we're keeping you up to date on our COVID-19 blog on our website, quadcitieschamber.com. If you haven't signed up for our e-news yet, you can still do that on our website. The Chamber is going to continue to host these virtual events on topics that matter most to businesses during this unprecedented time. The Chamber is here to serve businesses in our region, and we know that together we win. This webinar will be recorded and posted on the Chamber website later this afternoon. We want to thank our sponsor, Exelon Generation, for sponsoring the event, and we will address the most frequently asked questions, as well as take questions from participants. If you have any questions for the Senator, you should enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many questions as possible. And joining us today is Senator Chuck Grassley for a Q&A on what employers need to know about what he's doing to help combat the COVID-19 crisis. He's going to give uh, very brief open remarks, and then we'll open it up for questions. Again, use the Q&A box at the bottom, and we'll open it up uh, for questions. But now, turn it over to Senator Grassley. Senator? Yes, I thank you for this opportunity to uh, talk to dozens and dozens of people in the Quad City area and to answer your questions. Uh, we're going through a difficult time, whether you're a big business or small business, uh, very difficult time. Uh, I know you folks in just normal times ought to be, and I do applaud you for your leadership in your community, uh, whether you're uh, business people or civic leaders or political leaders, whatever the case might be. Uh, but these are not normal times now. And, uh, and particularly, uh, I'm looking for advice from uh, health professionals and uh, local leaders. And I take opportunity to uh, tell you I'm trying to practice this spacing that we have, six feet. And for three weeks, uh, I left, uh, uh, let's see, uh, last Saturday, I arrived at my home in Iowa uh, because Congress has closed down for one extra week than the normal uh, Easter recess. So for three weeks, uh, uh, not only to protect other people, but to protect me and my wife, we're probably going to be doing all of our communication by uh, internet, social media, and like I'm doing with you on the telephone, we've canceled uh, Easter gathering of family and friends, usually 30 people. That's been going on for four decades. And, uh, and we uh, doing FaceTime with, uh, with everybody, including our five kids. So I'm going to stop there except to remind you what you're probably already doing. Wash your hands, use disinfectant. Uh, don't sneeze uh, except on your arm. Uh, elbow and and everything else you're hearing from everybody else. I hope I'm properly uh, practicing it. I'm ready for the first question, or if you don't have question, just whatever your comment is. Definitely. Well, thank you. Thank you for those opening remarks, Senator Grassley. Again, if people have questions, please uh, add them to the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And again, we'll get to as many questions as we can. They're already starting to roll in. So we will start off with the first one. We saw the CARES Act passed and signed by the president last week. What are some of the highlights that we should be aware about? Okay, I think uh, for the massive amount of people, it'll be the $1,200 individual check, $2,400 for a couple, $500 for kids, uh, and that's a one-shot deal, and the Secretary of Treasury said the first check should be deposited uh, electronically. Uh, they'll, if they have to write checks, that'll be later on. And uh, uh, maybe in, I think he said two or three weeks, that's really faster than it happened the last time it was done in 2008 when we started the, the Great Recession. Uh, other, uh, policy in my committee was uh, extending unemployment compensation and uh, and having a flat $600 
same throughout the 50 states in addition to what the states usually do. And I want you to know that we're all cognizant of the fact that in some states, we may have people working or uh, taking unemployment, making more than if they had a job. And we know that that's got a uh, bad impact on getting uh, people back to work and particularly solving our, uh, our, uh, our situation where it's hard to get jobs filled in the first place. But if you want to know why that was done, we got 50 different states with 50 different commuter systems. And we were talking about it ought to be in relationship to what the uh, unemployment compensation is in a particular state. But uh, some states could uh, do that almost immediately. Uh, other states could do it in eight or 10 weeks. And there was one state that wouldn't have the capability of doing it at all. And so that's why we ended up with a flat amount and the negative consequences of doing that, but also the positive comments of helping people that are unemployed through no fault of their own. Then we, uh, uh, then we have the small business provisions. Uh, I'm told that 7,000 small businesses were uh, uh, handled yesterday. I got that off of TV this morning from people uh, in the uh, Treasury Department. Um, and uh, so uh, the, the idea is to get $350 billion out so small business will not uh, lay people off. Uh, and, uh, and if you keep them on, it'll be a forgiven uh, loan. And uh, you go to your local bank and that local bank has to have uh, a relationship with SBA. Uh, then for uh, that's for co companies or businesses under 500 employees. If you're over 500 employees, there's several things that we did. The most help will probably be coming from the additional money that we gave to uh, S uh, uh, gave to the Federal Reserve, uh, who can leverage about ten dollars for every one that they have. But in addition, we uh, de uh, we uh, went back and changed uh, for for just this tax year uh, net operating loss if you had it we did away with that in the 2017 tax bill uh, you can apply for for that uh, and then you don't have to pay your payroll taxes uh, this year you'll have uh, 21 and 22 uh, years to recoup that to the trust fund. And that's mostly what came out of my committee. Uh, the other things that uh, are important is $150 billion for hospitals and delivery of health care, and particularly for our rural hospitals, 125% uh, of Medicare to help them with their cash flow because uh, because they uh, aren't, aren't doing elective surgery where a lot of their income comes from. Now, there's probably a hundred other things that I could do there. Maybe just one last thing. This whole operation that ended up in the CARES Act, we uh, went into it with our eyes wide open. We don't know how long it's going to take to get this pandemic under control. Uh, we don't know how long it's going to take once that's done for the economy to turn around. We hope it can be done in the 90 days uh, that uh, that most of these provisions are good for. Uh, if uh, and, and and with an understanding, if it doesn't happen, we're probably going to be back to the table uh, looking at all these things for a longer period of time. We hope not, because we uh, we want to. We want people to be productive because productivity is what increases the wealth of our nation. Absolutely. Does that give you some, does that answer that question? Absolutely. That's, that's a perfect response to a very uh, large package. It's not every day that the government rolls out a $2 trillion package and trying to unravel everything that's in there is it, it would take some time. So that's a very great answer, Senator. Going to yeah, the next and, it sh and it should have, the benefit of of uh, leveraging about six billion uh, six trillion dollars 
because of the 450 billion that went to uh, the Federal Reserve and multiply that by 10 times. That's great. That's the first time we, we've heard that. So that's a, that's a great point to, to make there, Senator. The next question is, uh, although the Federal Response Act and CARES Act have been signed into law, it takes several days for agencies implementing the financial assistance programs. Like our small business, to maintain cash on hand is most important until these funds become available. What is your initiation or what are your plans to make these funds available any sooner? Well, like I said, uh, treasury and small business and, uh, and a very short form and working directly with the bank and the bank short circuiting a uh, lot of red tape that would normally go on to get an SBA loan of about 30 days. Uh, like I said yesterday, the bill was signed a week ago today. Uh, seven small, 7,000 small businesses were, uh, uh, were benefited yesterday. So I don't know how many businesses we have, but that tells you that the idea is to keep these people on the payroll, encourage the small business to keep them on the payroll and get this help out as fast as we can. And if they keep them on the payroll, it'll be a forgivable loan. Perfect. All right, our next question is actually coming from the Mayor of Davenport Center, Mayor Mike Matson. He says, we greatly appreciate the support from the federal government through the CARES Act. Davenport has been advised of a significant allocation of CDBG However, thus far, the business as usual regulations of HUD are in place, making it very difficult to get money to those who need it most now. Can we count on your support to advocate HUD to eliminate some red tape and streamline so we can quickly react to the needs of our community? Well, I'm not, hopefully in this particular instance, uh, that, uh, that that's not going to be a problem because the whole idea of the CARES Act was to get the money out as fast as we could. Uh, if uh, I can tell you this, that if there is a problem, uh, I want your people to work with Sherry very closely and she'll make the necessary uh, phone calls. And she's been doing that for me for 20 some years. So she knows how to cut that red tape better than I do. <laughs> but I would, I would expect that uh, that uh, uh, that the money would go out under formulas that already exist. But I don't know the particular conditions that might be in the CARE Act. Uh, my estimate would be just to add money to the existing programs and go out under the same formula that they had before. But maybe that's not the way it's going to work. But uh, wherever you got a problem, let us know. Yeah, perfect. And Senator, I want to uh, commend you and your staff for um, the their availability and keeping us updated through these unprecedented times. Your staff has been very responsive, very helpful, not only to the Quad Cities Chamber, but to our members as well. So I um, want to give them a shout out and, and say thank yeah. you. And as well yeah. as anybody on the phone has any questions, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And again, we're going to get to as many as we possibly can. Let me uh, uh, do an additional bit of information because I may have misled mm -hmm. by saying that when the checks, uh, 7,000 people or businesses were, were, that was based upon Treasury's guidance. Uh, uh, SBA is putting out their guidance today. Perfect. Perfect. All right. The next question is, uh, Senator, thank you for all that you've done to provide much needed federal assistance to individuals and businesses. While for-profit businesses and 501c3 nonprofits are eligible for funding, other nonprofits like 501c6 organizations aren't eligible. Is there a way to help any of these organizations? Okay. What, what's the last, uh, what group is it that's not helped? Uh, the 501c6 organizations are not eligible. Uh, well, you better tell me what five O's, what kind of organizations those are. Those would be uh, like the Chamber of Commerce, for example, are, are not eligible for uh, programs like the Paycheck Protection Program, um, some of the other programs within the CARE Act. I can't give you a reason, 
I could speculate, and, and, it's, and a politician shouldn't speculate, but uh, uh, my guess is that, uh, that if they're advocacy groups, as opposed to dealing directly with uh, 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 social, uh, what, what do you want to call it, humanitarian sort of things, mm -hmm. might be the reason. So I don't know uh, to what extent that would be necessary. I suppose what you're kind of saying now is uh, ch uh, local chambers of Congress, uh, if they're supported by small business and the small business can't pay their dues, they're hurt. Is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah, that 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 could be one example. There's a lot of other C6 organizations yeah. that could be in there. But well, that's a great yeah, this is the answer to your question. If there's a legitimacy for doing it, and I don't want to make that judgment now, but we ought to consider every uh, plea that we get because that's our job. We, uh, if we, like I said, in 90 days, if things don't turn around and we get this pandemic somewhat under control and people can go back to work, uh, then we're going to have to go through this again. And that's something you want to throw at us at that point. Perfect. Yeah, we, we had a similar conversation with uh, your colleague, Senator Ernst, on Wednesday, and she talked about uh, phase four uh, possibly coming down the pipeline. What are your thoughts on a, on a potential phase four from the federal government? It's too early to make that decision, but we left the door open for that. But people that are talking about everything that ought to be in phase four, it seems to me like they lost faith in America, uh, that uh, somehow... Uh, it's, uh, we're going to spend the rest of our life uh, li living off of decisions made in Washington, D.C. instead of by 167 million different taxpayers uh, work, working hard and using their own g ingenuity or their own labor to decide for themselves. And all that collectively is what's made America great. 535 members of Congress and one president, whether they're Republican or Democrat, uh, c can't be considered uh, to have all the brains and all the ideas and all the initiative uh, that uh, that's going to make America great. No, it's the individual that's made America great. And, uh, and I haven't lost faith in America. And we may be wrong that things are going to turn around in 90 days, but I'm not going uh, to plead surrender uh, on April the 3rd. Uh, I might uh, do that on July the 3rd but not today. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So another question coming in. Um, we've had a couple of questions about the um, Iowa stay-at-home order. I know that's not in your, uh, in your jurisdiction and that's uh, within the state government, but uh, what are your thoughts on a stay-at-home order? Is that something that you'd be pushing the government to do? Or are you uh, still pushing back on that? What are your thoughts on a stay-at-home well, order in Iowa? You, you mean, for, uh, did you say homeless? Nope. Uh, stay at home. The stay at home order. Oh, similar to well, the, the governor, the governor made it. Uh, I, oh no, the governor has not made a decision to do that. Well, mm -hmm. let, yeah, let me, uh, I spoke to this yesterday, uh, to a group. So let me, uh, speak the same to you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to start at the national level, even though this is a state decision, the president speaks to it as they have guidance. And what the president never makes clear that I wish he would is that uh, the federal government under the Constitution can't make states do this or that unless there's money tied to it. And, uh, and uh, so uh, what we're talking about comes under what is historically been called the police powers of state government. That's the power to uh, protect health welfare and public safety. And that's up to the governors or the laws of that particular state. So the president can urge or, or have hands off whatever he wants. But what this has done, I would expect governors of states to do it the same way the president is on the guidance. Listen to the public health professionals. Mm -hmm. and make your decision based upon their advice, and their advice ought to be based on data. And so far, what I've had in my telephone conversation with Governor Reynolds 
and listening to her news conferences, she's doing exactly the same thing. She's listening to her healthcare professionals, and she is, uh, uh, and and presumably they're following the data. So I think she's uh, uh, very carefully approaching this, uh, probably reconsidering it every day, and so far has decided not to do it. And I think she's been doing a good job, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it up to her uh, to make that decision. And uh, and constitutionally, that's the way it should be. But every state's different. Look at even California, uh, uh, 40 million people compared to New York. Look at how the governor of uh, California has been handling this, and 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 that's different than New York, better than New York. And uh, and then you got uh, every every state's a little bit different. So again, uh, all knowledge does not reside in Washington D.C., and the Constitution uh, protects the governors uh, with their regulation of of uh, public safety, health, and welfare. Perfect. Well, Senator, the next question comes in from the Quad Cities Chamber President Paul Rumler. He says, last year during the devastating floods, the chamber heard from many businesses that SBA loans weren't going to be helpful because it required them to take on additional debt. And we heard that again the last few weeks as well. So he wanted to thank you for listening to the concerns and providing direct assistance uh, to impacted business through the payroll protection program. Uh, just a quick comment to, to that. Well, I, I, I spoke about the substance of it, the purpose of it. Mm -hmm. and uh, to keep people employed and things of that nature. I don't know whether, unless he's got a specific question, uh, all I can say is that uh, I think that at the state level, Governor Reynolds has been doing a good job working with small businesses. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, the ones that have had to close down, it's, it's a problem. Uh, the states make those decisions uh, and uh, the federal government stepping in to help through the SBA program, uh, as I've already uh, talked about the substance of it. And, and we're going to go to the last question, and it's related to SBA. It's uh, my local bank doesn't have the information yet to file the applications for the payroll protection program. Have you heard anything from SBA or Treasury Department on when they might be able to process those applications? Yeah. Uh, uh, guidance is coming out from the SBA today. Guidance was out from Treasury a couple of days ago, and uh, and this small business person should be able to go to their bank or credit union uh, as long as that bank or credit union has a working relationship with uh, with uh, uh, SBA. And I saw this on television yesterday uh, that somebody said downloaded one sheet of paper that's all you need for the application so uh, a person could go to the SBA download that application form uh, fill it out take it to a bank that has a relationship and the idea is to get the money out very quickly now, I, uh, you've, you've heard me before talk about 7,000 businesses, and I heard this on television today. So without the SBA guidance being out until today, I don't know exactly how uh, 7,000 businesses could have been financed up to this point, but that's the, that's the uh, impression I got from the news report. Perfect. Well, we are coming up on the end of the call in our half hour, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Again, this webinar was recorded, and it's going to be available on our website, quadcitieschamber.com. And be sure to keep up with us on social media. I want to thank Senator Chuck Grassley for joining us, and we're going to turn it over to him just for some quick closing remarks. Senator? Yeah. Well, thanks for the opportunity to communicate with you. And uh, uh, my office in Washington, D.C., is shut down like I think most Senate offices are, but everybody on the staff is working from home. Uh, we, uh, for instance, I got my mail report for today. We got 1,100 uh, emails from constituents on various subjects. Uh, 
and uh, we're uh, obviously we're way behind because of the pandemic. Unlike most times, we are are, are only uh, three or four thousand letters behind. Uh, there's uh, uh, many more this time that we're behind, but uh, the number that is uh, 30 days or less is under 500 out of the thousands that are remaining to be answered. Yesterday, we sent out about 1,300 responses, uh, so continue to communicate. And uh, if you need help from my office, other than just giving me your opinion, uh, you should uh, probably uh, best way to go to grassley.senate.gov and look up the people that you would normally communicate with and communicate with them by email, but they're also available in their homes on the phone. And then my Iowa offices, like there in Davenport, are open, although some people may be working from home, but we do have our offices in Iowa open. So I hope that uh, we're uh, as available uh, to you as we always are, and you ought to communicate not only your views, but problems that we can help you with, including uh, some of the problems we've talked about on this interview uh, and phone conversation today. Thank you very much for allowing me to communicate with you. All right, well, thank you, Senator. Thanks again to everyone for joining us. Thanks to Exelon for sponsoring, and please join us for our uh, webinars next week which you can sign up on the Quad Cities Chamber website when those are available. Thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your day.